Well, it's a great pleasure to see you again, Joseph. And let me just tell people if they don't know that you have a hugely successful YouTube channel. So you've got over half a million subscribers. So 556,000, as I just checked today. And you only started the channel in 2015, so that's an incredible achievement. And um, you also went to Iowa State University. You've got a master's in business, dual degrees in finance and communications. You hold the CFA, the Chartered Financial Analyst qualification. So that certainly sets you apart, I'd say, from about 99% of YouTubers in terms oh, of qualifications. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, it is kind of a unique background. Uh, started in venture capital, uh, worked private wealth management, and then, you know, from there, actually took that to uh, to online, to blogging and YouTube. And I, I mean, honestly, I, I love when I was working VC and private wealth, it was all just, well, well you know this so from your experience, just working with that top 1%, right? The uh, the accredited investors and that. And so it's 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 great to be able to bring that experience to to the Main Street community and the Main Street investors and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's funny, all that, ex all the experience and, and uh, all the professional analysis that I've done uh, through through clients and things like that. I think the biggest lessons I've learned from investing and what I share mostly on the channel is my own mistakes as a personal investor. You know, I started investing in 1999, uh, which of course was a great year to start investing because we all know what happened the year after that. But uh, just those those personal investing mistakes that, that I've made and that everybody makes and, and that you really have to learn from those. So let's move on to the uh, topic which we're gonna to discuss today. I thought it would be a good opportunity given our background is in professional investment and everybody's kind of panicking at the moment i think about what's going on in markets understandably so the s p is just kind of flirting with a bear market and the nasdaq is down by over 27 percent as i make this video so what would you say is probably the best way to react to that kind of scary environment at the moment Sure, sure. Well, I'm beyond nervous. I, I think a lot of people are freaking the hell out, right? Uh, they're panicking about their stocks. Uh, and it's it's such a different environment from what a lot of investors are used to. A lot of investors that just started, well, hell, even that started 10 years ago, uh, have seen nothing but uh, really a bull market over the last decade. Uh, but especially over the last few years when all you had to do was throw a dart and, and you found a, a winning stock, right? Uh, so, so investors are reasonably worried that uh, this is this is not something that they've ever uh, been been accustomed to, and and I think uh, it's important to to really step back and look at that longer term picture because if you look at any stock chart over the last 40, 50, 100 years even, you see these dips, uh, but there's one guarantee that stocks do do eventually rebound and hit new highs and. And I think, you know, we can talk about some different, some of the different ways to, uh, to stay sane really in this bear market and really turn it to your advantage. But I think uh, the biggest is just really changing your perception uh, and, and realizing that, yes, you know, uh, stocks are down now. It sucks to see your portfolio in the red, but this is the best time to make money. This is, you know, probably the biggest lesson I've learned over 20 plus years of investing. And, and as a professional analyst, uh, your best investments are made when you're buying in this in the bear market you know you're buying at these discounts for these stocks that are going to be you know the next amazon or the next apple or or something like that i've heard it described like running into a burning building because <laughs> it's so difficult to do that when you can see these losses and yet you have to kind of buy when everybody else is going the other way so it is difficult to be contrarian so i think it is. i can understand that people have difficulty doing that but like you say it's probably the best kind of behavior so at the moment I mean, looking across different sectors, for example, are there any sectors that really stand out to you as maybe presenting the best opportunities? Because, you know, one thing that did well going into this crisis was obviously commodity funds. And sure. Warren Buffett, for example, is buying more oxy. It was Occidental yeah. Petroleum, Occidental, is that huh? right? So, yeah, it's interesting that he's uh, he's buying a, an energy company now. He's, he's uh, stayed away from that in the past, but now he's, I mean, they, and they are cash flow machines. They are those, those energy stocks, those energy companies, 
Whereas in the past, uh, anytime oil prices rose, then the energy companies were, they were drill baby drill, right? They were, uh, they were finding as much production as they could to, uh, to take advantage of those prices. Well, now they're having a little bit longer term view where they're saying, okay, you know what? We see the writing on the wall. Uh, fossil fuel uh, usage is going down. It's being replaced over the next five, 10 years and longer. Uh, so they're not reinvesting that money quite as much. They're not spending so much on capital expenditures to find those new wells and increase that production. So yeah, they are just cash flow machines right now and probably over the next few years um even you know even even after the ukraine conflict is resolved or settled or or however that comes out um there is just not enough supply of oil you know on the market so oil prices are, are going to be high these companies a lot of them especially the larger integrated ones like chevron like royal dutch they they have cost of productions you know uh, all in sustaining costs uh, of around 30 to, to 40 dollars a barrel right so even if oil comes down to 80 dollars a barrel then uh, they are still they're still making a lot of money they're returning that to uh, to shareholders in the form of dividends and share buybacks and, and so i think that's a lot of what warren buffett sees uh, in occidental and and what i think a lot of uh, investors can find in a lot of these energy stocks so so that is one you know one sector i think that uh, investors can look to and i think uh, an added benefit of that in investing in some energy stocks is that it can act, kind of act as a balance to your portfolio right as long as oil prices stay high inflation is going to be high. Uh, you know, the economy is, is going to look a little bit weaker, but your oil stocks are going to do great, right? Uh, if oil prices do come down, then, you know, obviously uh, your oil stocks are going to get hit a little bit. They'll still be cash flow machines. You're still going to collect those great dividends, but uh, those stocks will come down. But presumably the rest of your portfolio will probably do a little bit better, right? Because that inflation, that energy uh, cost inflation is going to come down a little bit uh, on that. So, so it's kind of a nice balance. Uh, some other sectors that I'm looking at uh, really kind of depends on your outlook and, and how long you or what you want to do with your portfolio. Uh, for someone looking to protect their portfolio from what could be uh, even further market declines, you know, through the rest of the year. It's really instructive to, again, look at what happened in past past sell offs. Uh, again, that research uh, on the 2008 crash uh, looked at things like, you know, drug makers did really well. Um, the dollar and discount stores did really well. Actually, surprisingly, the auto parts stores do really well, tend to do well in a recession as well. Uh, it's kind of a non-cyclical idea to people need to fix up their cars. If they're not buying new cars, they're going to need to fix up their old ones. So they're going to need those parts, right? So um, so just uh, three three areas that uh, that tend to, tend to do well during a recession don't fall quite as much as other stocks. Uh, as far as, you know, maybe a further, uh, an outlook a little bit further on, then I think some of the uh, some of those uh, some of those hardest hit sectors are actually looking very attractive. Uh, the, you've got the things like the growth stocks and the tech stocks, even the social media stocks that have been hit so hard over the past year, starting to look very attractive on those valuation bases. And uh, they're still the same growth companies, right? A lot of a lot of investors come to me and they say, you know, I was investing in maybe Teladoc or SoFi Technologies, and it was a growth stock. It was making me rich uh, just a few years ago, and now it's not. You know, now it's it's dropped by 70, 80 um, percent. And you know, I ask them, okay, what's changed about the company? Nothing. It's still producing 20, 30 percent annual sales growth. Uh, they're still, uh, you know, improving their profitability and, and profit margins and things like that. Um, so. You know, whereas whereas nobody could support those those valuations that these stocks were trading at, these growth stocks were trading at just a year ago or two, 20, 30 times price to uh, price to sales basis. Now they're trading at two or three times price to sales. They're still growth companies. They're still going to change the world in their industries, and they they've still got those competitive advantages in those growth industries. So if you can have a five to ten year outlook or, or holding period on your stocks. I think, yeah, we're seeing some very attractive uh, valuations in some of these growth names. How about companies which aren't necessarily generating a profit right now? Mm -hmm. Do you still think those are in with a shot or do you think that's too risky in this kind of environment? Now that sure. interest rates are a little bit higher, which tends to be a headwind for growth stocks, particularly the profitless ones. Sure. Well, and I, I don't know, you know, that that seems to be kind of the hedge lately uh, by by analysts. Uh, Jim Cramer talks about this constantly that, oh, you need to be buying quality companies. Right. And, and by quality, he's defining that as profitable companies. Right. These these any company that's that's pr producing positive earnings, uh, earnings per share. Uh, and I think, you know, call, calling the quality is a little bit of a misnomer because, you know, I, I mean, hell, Amazon 
just became profitable not you know not not less less than 10 years ago right um you know ipo in 97 for a dec- more than a decade it was unprofitable right uh, tesla just became profitable on a on an annual basis just a couple of years ago right and uh, and nobody can argue that those weren't quality companies you know and, and ultimately very good investments uh j- but just because they were they were unprofitable at that point so i don't know that you can really draw the distinction distinction only between uh, profitable earnings and, and not uh, for a company. You know, I think you really do need to d- look deeper. You need to look for companies in growth industries. Okay, so you look for an industry that is growing, um, you know, and is going to lift up all the companies within it, going to provide that tailwind. And then you look for companies within that industry that are, you know, really have that competitive advantage, have faster sales growth. So they, uh, you know, have some kind of a competitive advantage that is coming through in higher market share and the sell that sales growth whether it's through branding, marketing, uh, some kind of product innovate, innovation, anything like that. Something that gives them real staying power and real advantage within that growing industry. I think that's really where you need to look at. Uh, and I know that's, that's probably frustrating that it's not just a, a binary decision like, oh, well, this, this company has uh, profitable earnings, this one doesn't, so this one is a better, a better stock. It, it's just not that simple. Uh, I know the media likes to make it out as uh, as that simple, but it, it's just it's just not because that's where the bloodbath has really been, isn't it? The profit it has case. it has you know and, and you know on some accounts rightfully so there there were a lot of companies, especially the ones that came through on SPAC listings or or just IPO'd over the last couple of years, and uh, those valuations were just ridiculously high twenty thirty. I mean I I don't care if you are profitable or not twenty or thirty times sales or fifty and a hundred times price to earnings that you just can't you, you just can't rationalize that kind of uh that kind of valuation right so clearly you believe that you can beat the broad market by sing- choosing single stocks i mean my belief is a little bit less um i don't really think you can do that very effectively over the long term because many professional investors can't so sure. what do you think gives you an edge when you're doing this kind of analysis compared to say a professional fund manager that also fails to beat the benchmark like sure, sure. The time. And, and it's a viable question and a great question. And honestly, I don't know that I that I truly believe that anyone can can beat the market uh, for an extended period. I, I mean, you've got you've got obviously notable names like Peter Peter Lynch, Bill Miller, Miller, things like that. I, I mean, the, just the zions of of investing. Um, I, I'd be a little naive or arrogant to think that I could do better than that, or or I could do it on, on a consistent basis. Um, what I think is important, though, is a lot of investors. They have that itch, right? They 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 feel that that itch to invest their own money, to control their own destiny uh, financially, right? Uh, and if they're not picking individual stocks, or if they don't have a part of their portfolio where they're doing that, they're just gonna muck up everything else, right? So what I what I usually say uh, to to solve that that dilemma is have ten or fifteen percent of your wealth or, or of your portfolio in those individual stocks that you can pick that you can say okay you know what i want to try to find the next amazon because if you do i i mean you know a thousand dollars invested in amazon in 2002 at its low around six dollars a share that would be worth uh five hundred thousand dollars now right so you know whether by luck or analysis or, or just good fortune or whatnot uh you know that's that that is an amazing return and uh anyone that would have stuck with that stock for, for that period it's hard to deny that they they made a very good uh, in investment decision on an individual stock, um, but but yeah, just 10, 15 percent of your money in that to 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 satisfy that itch, uh, and that gives you uh, that that means you're not playing with, uh, for lack of a better word, or or investing with the rest of your portfolio, which can be in you know individual funds, uh, asset you know broadly asset uh, asset class funds like. You know, stocks, bonds, real estate, uh, even in some fund themes like uh, maybe a dividend fund or a growth fund, things like that to give you a little bit broader diversified exposure, right? So you're still getting the market return on the vast majority of your money, you know, 70, 80 percent even. Uh, and, and you still have you're still satisfying that itch that that a lot of investors feel so much that that they need to be able to pick stocks and they need to control have that sense of control in their investments. Yeah, I call that my fund portfolio and it's it's yeah. sole reason for existence is just to keep me engaged and to keep my hands exactly. off my core portfolio, which is like 90% of my investments, which is like yeah. global equity and global bonds. It's literally two funds, three funds, really simple. 
So I think, you know, a similar, similar approach, but Definitely. I think it's just fun, isn't it? To choose stocks and to choose themes to try it's, and, you know, just engage with markets. You just learn that way, I think. It, it is, you know, and I mean, um, it, whether it's, uh, whether it's almost uh, an addiction like gambling, uh, thinking you're going to get rich or just, uh, just as you put it, just a, a sense of engagement and, and a sense of learning. You know, following following the economy, following the market, following that big top down picture uh, is just it's it's a great hobby. And then last two points before we finish is let's just step back for a moment to different asset types. So clearly, you talk about equity a lot, but do you think there are any opportunities in other asset classes, such as listed real estate or maybe credit at the moment, or maybe? maybe even a geographic tilt to another country other than the than the US? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, you know, I, I haven't ventured uh, quite uh, quite outside of uh, of equities as, as I used to. Uh, my, you know, YouTube keeps me pretty busy in, in stock analysis and, and the econ economy. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, come on, just these last six months, I guess, has really brought back the importance of having some commodity exposure in a portfolio and it doesn't have to be a, a lot obviously you know over the past 20 or 30 years commodity has a, has had a, a pretty pretty weak track record as far as returns but we do see those those instances where even a five percent exposure to a, a commodity fund uh is is really uh, really helps to to spread it to to lower your risk and you know increase increase the portfolio returns so so i would say you know look at look at a commodity fund uh real estate you know i, I think real estate is coming down uh quite a bit i don't see don't see quite as much pain in commercial real estate although you know that tends to lag so maybe we'll see a little bit more weakness in commercial real estate but but uh you know commercial states are a great uh, especially direct direct investment is, is a great tax haven uh for for people that need it uh, and for even those investing just in indirectly in the real estate stocks and the REITs, it's a great way to kind of smooth out the the bumps in the uh, in an equity portfolio. So, you know that um, as far as bonds, bonds obviously have gotten a really bad name this year uh, as they've kind of fallen along with stocks. But if you look, they they really haven't fallen quite as much. I mean, they've still provided that that element of protection, right? I think the, the Vanguard BSV, so the short-term bond fund is down only, you know, maybe 7% so far this year against, against a, uh, you know, a, a, what is it? Something like 18, 18, 19% uh, fall on the S&P 500. So yeah, uh, it hasn't protected you completely from that stock market sell-off or from those pain, from that pain, but, uh, but it has, has provided some kind of a, a protection for your, for your money. So, so don't, uh, don't completely write off you know, uh, bonds either. And do you buy the story that we're entering a US recession right now? Because, you know, the data still looks pretty good. You know, record low unemployment. People are still going out and buying stuff. So sure, sure. retail sales are still reasonably strong. Sure. Consumer so, uh, consumer spending is still strong. Uh, I think I saw a note a couple of weeks ago, JP Morgan still estimated that, that the consumer still had uh, or households had between three to six months of excess savings built up from the pandemic. So, uh, you know, that takes us even through the end of the year as far as consumer spending. It, it is just hard to see how uh, how the Fed, you know, pulls back on so much the the, the immense amount of liquidity that they pumped into the system over the past few years, 8.6% uh, inflation. Uh, and, and the fact that, you know, the jobs market is so good is not going to make that job any easier, right? Uh, as long as, as long as we have a, a strong, strong jobs picture and record low uh, unemployment, then, uh, you know, wages are going to be increasing, people are still going to be spending, and it is just going to make it all the more difficult to bring that inflation rate down. So, so I do think, you know, I do think the Fed is going to have to obviously be as aggressive as possible and, and is going to err on the side of, a, a, you know, slower growth and a recession. Uh, it's just, you know, the Fed doesn't have a, a great track record for that anyway. Uh, and, it's, and it's hard to see them doing any better this time. So I do, I do actually think we will see a recession next year in 2023. Now, presumably that means earnings will come down. So would that affect your your view on equity at all, maybe mm -hmm. reduce risk a little bit? Sure, sure. Well, I've been I've been telling investors to take advantage of these bear market rallies. Uh, you know, these these little these short 10 or even 15 percent increases in, in equity prices uh, that we've seen several times already this year. Take advantage of those if you don't already have that that strong cash position or those that strong, you know, maybe bond position or, or other assets. 
take advantage of those to kind of dial back the risk in equities because I, I do think I do think we get uh, you know legs lower in the equity markets uh, if you just look at you know look at just the the historical numbers uh, I think Deloitte uh, Deloitte estimates that recessions have caused corporate earnings uh, in the S and P five hundred to to go down between ten to twenty percent in in previous recessions uh, analysts still see. Uh, earnings next year at $250, $251 for companies in the S&P 500, that would be above this year's $230, right? So they still see strong earnings growth uh, next year. And I think that's, it's undeniable that has to come down. Yeah, they haven't read the memo yet from the Fed. Yeah. Yeah. So it was an immense pleasure talking to you, Joseph. If people want to find you, I assume they'd go to Let's Talk Money, which is your, your YouTube channel, and they can join the Bowtie Nation. Because normally sure. you wear the bow tie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of a relaxing today, uh, taking the day off from the bow tie. But but yeah, nice. I'd love to see people come to the channel, join the community there. Uh, great, uh, I love YouTube for its for that face to face connection you get with people. Uh, also, I have a blog called mystockmarketbasics.com. You can find me on there. Uh, it's a little bit more basic, not quite as much stock picking and, and and that kind of thing, but just really getting back to the basics in stocks. Brilliant! It was a, such a pleasure talking to you, and hopefully we'll talk again in future. Sure. My pleasure. Thanks, Ron. Take care. Thanks.